Okay, we're back. We are in Cambridge, Massachusetts. This is Dave Vellante. I'm here with Jeff Kelly. We're with Wikibon. This is theCUBE, Silicon Angles production. We're here at the MIT Information Quality Symposium in the heart of database design and development. Uh, we've had some great guests on. Scott Hauser is here. He's the head of marketing at Hadapt, a company that we've introduced to our community you know, quite some time ago, um, really bringing multiple channels into the Hadoop, Hadoop ecosystem and helping make sense out of all this data, bringing insights to this data. Scott, welcome back to theCUBE. Thanks for having me, it's good to be here. So this, this notion of data quality, the reason why we asked you to be on here today is because, first of all, you're a practitioner. Um, you've been in the data warehousing world for a long, long time, so you've struggled with this issue. Um, the people here today uh, are really from the world of, hey, we've been doing big data for a long time, this whole big data theme is you know, nothing new to us. Sure. But there's a lot new. Um, and so, take us back to your days as a, as a, as a data practitioner, uh, data sure. warehousing, business intelligence. Um, what were some of the data quality issues that you faced, and how did you deal with them? So I think um, a couple of points to raise in that area are, you know, one of the things we like to do is try and triangulate on a user to engage them. And every channel we wanted to go and bring into the fold created a, a unique dimension of how do we validate that this is the same person, right? Because each channel that you uh, engage with has potentially different requirements of um, user accreditation or a guarantee of you know, single user, if you will. So I, I think the holy grail used to be, in a lot of ways, like single sign-on or a way to triangulate across disparate systems one common identity or person to make that world simple. I don't think that's a reality in the, in the sense that when you look at um, a, pro a product provider or a solution provider and a customer that's external, right, those, those two worlds are very disparate and, and there's a lot of channels and poten potentially even third party needs that I might want to engage this individual by and every time I want to bring another one of those channels online, it further complicates you know, validating who that person may be. Okay, so, so when you were doing your data warehouse thing, again, as an IT practitioner, um, you had, you, you're trying to expand the channels, but every time you did that, it complexified the, the data yeah. source. And so how did you deal with that problem? Did so you just create another database and store five everything? Well, or? unfortunately, it, it absolutely creates this, this notion of islands of information throughout the enterprise, because as you mentioned, you know, we, you define a schema effectively, and mm -hmm. you place um, data elements into that schema of how you identify and how you engage and, and how you um, rate that person's behaviors or engagement, et cetera. And I think what you'd see is as you'd bring on these sources, the time to actually merge those things together wasn't in the order of days or weeks, it's on months and years. And so with every new channel that became interesting, right, you further complicate the problem and effectively what you do is you end up creating these pools of information and you take extracts and you try and do something to munch the data and put it in a place where you give access to an analyst to say, okay, here's yet another um, sample set of data, try and figure out if these things align and can you try and create effectively a new schema that includes all the additional data that we just added. So it's interesting, because again, one of the themes that we've been hearing a lot at this conference, and you hear it a lot in, 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 in many conferences, it's not the technology, it's the people and process around the technology. That's certainly any IT pers person would agree with that. But at the same time, the technology historically has been problematic, in particular oh, sure. the data warehouse technology has been, been challenging. You, so you've had to keep databases relatively small and disparate, and you've had to build business processes around those That's databases. Right. So you've not only got you know, deficient technology, if you will, no offense to, to my data warehousing friends, but you've got a, 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 a process creep. That's, that's absolutely that, fair. That, that's occurred. Yeah, and I think you know, what, what ends up happening is, it's one of the things that's led to sort of the, the, the revolution that's occurring in the market right now about you know, whether it's the Hadoop ecosystem or all the, the tangential technologies around that because what, what's bound uh, some of the technology issues in the past has been the schema, right? And as important as that is, because it gives um, people a, a, a very easy way to interact with the data, it also creates significant challenges when you want to bring on these unique sources of information. Because, you know, as you look at things that have happened over the last decade, the engagement process for either a consumer, a prospect, or a customer have changed pretty dramatically. And they don't all have the same stringent requirements about uh, providing information to become you know, engaged that way. So I think where the schema is, you know, has value, you know, obviously in the enterprise, it also has a lot of um, historical challenges that it brings along with it. Yeah, so um, this Hadoop 
movement is very disruptive to the traditional market space. As many folks say it isn't, a lot of traditional guys say it, say it isn't, but it clearly is, particularly as you go omni-channel. I threw that word out earlier. Omni-channel is a discussion that we had at a Hadoop Summit, myself, sure. John Furrier, Avi, Avi Mehta, and, as you're, and, and this is something that you guys are, are doing. You're Absolutely. bringing in data to allow your customers to go omni-channel. As you do that, you start to, again, increase the complexity of the, the corpus of data. At the same time, a lot of, lot of, a lot of times in Hadoop you hear about schema light, schema less. Yep. All right, so, so how do you reconcile the omni-channel, the schema less or schema light, and the data quality problem? Yeah, so I think for, you know, particularly speaking about Hadap, one of the things that we do is we give um, customers the ability to take and effectively dump all of that data into one common repository that is HDFS and Hadoop and leverage some of those open source tools and, and even their own, you know, um, inventions, if you will, you know, with MR code, pig, whatever, and allow them to effectively normalize the data through you know, iterations in Hadoop and then push that into tables effectively that now we can give access to via a SQL interface, right? So I think for us, the, the ability is, you're absolutely right, the more channels you can give access to, right? So this concept of an omni-channel where irrespective of what way we engage with the customer or what way they touch us in some way, being able to provide those dimensions of data in one common repository gives the, the marketeer, if you will, an incredible flexibility and insights that were previously would be undiscoverable. Assuming the data quality is there. Assuming right. the data quality is there. So, so that, that was going to be my question. So what are the data quality implications of using something like HDFS where you're essentially schema-less, you're just dumping data in essentially yep. to, a, to a raw format and, raw, and it's raw format. So now you've got to reconcile all these different types of data from different sources uh, and, and build out that kind of single view of a customer, of a product, whatever, whatever is your Some you're looking identifier. at. Right. So how do you go about doing that um, in that kind of scenario? So I think um, the, the, rep the repository in Hadoop or HDFS itself gives you that one common ground to work in because you've got you know, no implications of schema or any other uh, preconceived notions about how you're going to massage the data, if you will. And it's about applying logic and looking for those universal IDs. Uh, there are a bunch of tools around that are, are focused on this, but applying those tools in, in a means that doesn't um, handicap them from the start by predisposing them to some structure and enabling them to uh, decipher or cull out that through whether it's, again, homegrown type scripts, tools that might be upstairs here, and then effectively normalizing the data and moving it into some structure where you can then interact with it in a, in a meaningful way. Mm -hmm. So that really, uh, the kind of the old way of trying to bring you know, snippets of the data from different sources into a, yet another database where you've got to sure. apply structure, that takes time, months and years in some That's cases. Right. And so Hadoop really allows you to speed up that process significantly by basically eliminating that, that part of the equation. Yeah, I think there's, and there's a bunch of dimensions we can talk about, um, you know, things like even like pricing exercises, mm -hmm. right? And the quality of, you know, triangulating on what that pricing should be per product, per geography, per engagement, et cetera. And I think you see that, you know, a lot of those types of workloads have transitioned from, you know, mainframe type environments, uh, distributed environments of legacy to the, the Hadoop ecosystem. And, and we've seen cases where people talk about you know, going from, you know, eight month, you know, exercises to a week. And I think that that's where the value of this ecosystem in you know, the, the commodity scalability really provides you with flexibility that was just previously you know, unachievable. Mm -hmm. So could you provide some examples, um, either you know, your own from your own career or from some customers you're seeing, um, in terms of the data quality implications of the type of work they're doing? So one of our kind of theses is that you know, the data quality measures required for any given uh, use case varies. In some cases, d depending on the type of use case, uh, you know, if, and depending on the speed that you need the analysis done, uh, the type of data quality or the level of data quality is, gonna, is going to vary. Um, are you seeing that? And if so, can you give some examples of the yeah. different types of way data quality kind of manifests itself in, in big data workloads? Sure. So I think that's absolutely fair. And, you know, obviously there's, there's going to be some trade-off between accuracy and performance, right? Mm -hmm. And so you have to create some sort of confidence coefficient, pardon me, if you will, that, you know, within some degree of probability, this is good enough, right? And y there's got to be some sort of balance between mm -hmm. that accuracy and time. Um, some of the things that I, you know, I've seen a lot of customers being interested in is that there's this sort of market emerging around providing tools for you know, authenticity of engagement. So as an example, you know, I may be a large brand 
and I have very um, open channels that I engage somebody with, might be email, might be some web portal, et cetera. And there's a lot of phishing that goes on out there, right? And so people, you know, phishing for whether it's brands and misrepresenting themselves, et cetera. And there's a lot of, you know, desire to try and triangulate on, you know, data quality of who is effectively positioning themselves as me, who's really not me, and being able mm -hmm. to sort of, you know, take a, a cybersecurity spin and start to, to block those things down and, and alleviate those sort of um, nefarious activities. So we've seen a lot of people using you know, our tool to effectively understand and be able to pinpoint those activities based upon behaviors, based upon um, outliers, and, and looking at um, examples of where the engagement's coming from that aren't authentic. Mm -hmm. so that, if that makes sense, so that might be somewhat nebulous, but. Right, so using uh, analytics essentially to determine the authenticity of a of person, an of an entity, of an engagement, yeah. uh, rather than taking a more, rather than kind of looking at the data itself, using pattern detection to That's determine. Right. But, but also taking, you know, there's a bunch of, um, imp there's a bunch of raw data that exists out there mm -hmm. that needs, you know, when you put it together, again, back to this notion of this sort of, you know, landing zone, if you will, or data lake or whatever we want to call it, you know, putting all of this, this data into one repository where now I can start to do, you know, analytics against it without any sort of predetermined schema and start to understand, you know, are these people who are purporting to be, you know, firm XYZ, are they really firm XYZ? And if they're not, where are these things originating and how can we start to put filters or um, put things in place to alleviate those sort of those activities? Mm -hmm. And that could apply, it sounds like, to certainly private industry, but I mean, oh, it sounds sure. like something, you know, government would be very interested in terms of, um, you know, in the news about uh, different foreign countries potentially uh, being the, the source of attacks on, on U.S. Certainly. corporations or part of the uh, part of our infrastructure and trying to determine where that's coming from sure. and who these people are. Um, and of course, people are trying to, it gets complicated because they're trying to cover up their tracks, right? Certainly. I, but I think that the most important thing in this context is it's not necessarily about being able to look at it after the fact, hmm. but it's being able to look at a set of conditions that occur before these things happen and identify those conditions and put controls in place to alleviate the action from taking place. I think that's where when you look at what is happening from you know, an acceleration of these models and from an acceleration of you know, the quality of the data that you're gathering, mm -hmm. being able to put those things into place and put effective controls in place beforehand is changing you know, the, the loss prevention side of the business in, in this one example. But mm -hmm. you're, you're absolutely right from, from what I see and from what our customers are doing. It is, you know, it, it's multidimensional in that you know, there's cybersecurity that's one example, there's pricing that could be another example, there's, you know, engagement from a, a, a funnel analysis or a conversion ratio that could be yet another example. So I think you're right in that, in that it is ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. So when you think about the historical role of the, well, historical, uh, we had Stuart on earlier, he was saying the first known chief data officer we could find was 2003. So I guess that gives us a decade of, of, of history, but if you look back at the whole, I mean, data quality, we've been talking about that for many, many decades. Sure. So if you think about the traditional or role of an organization in trying to achieve data quality, single versions of truth, information quality, information value, um, and you inject it with this disruption of Hadoop, that, to me anyway, that whole notion of data quality is changing because in certain use cases, inference is just fine. Um, and false positives are great, I mean, who cares if you're That's right. you know, analyzing Twitter data in, in some cases. Uh, in others, like healthcare and financial services, it's, it's critical. But so how do you see the notion of data quality evolving and, and, and adapting to this new world? Well, I think one of the things you mentioned about this, you know, this single version of the truth was something that was, you know, when I was on the other side of the table. They were beating it, you over the head. Very, very, you know, <laughs> we can do this, we can do this. And it's, it's something that, you know, it sounds great on paper, but when you look at the practical implications of trying to do it in a um, very finite or stringent uh, s controlled way, it's not practical for the business. Because, because you're saying that the, the, the portions of your data that you can give a single version of the truth on are so small because of the, the elapsed time lag. That's right. Yeah. I think there's that dimension, but there's also this element of time, right? And yeah. the time that it takes to define something 
that can be that rigid and that yeah, structured. It's months, sir. It's months, and by that time, a lot of the uh, innovation the business is trying to accomplish. The APIs have changed. Gone. The initiatives it's have changed. Gone. Yeah. yeah. You lost the sale. Hey, but we got the data. Yeah, but look here. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I think that's you're right, and I think that's what's evolving. And I think there's this idea that you know what? Let's fail fast and let's do a lot of iterations and the flexibility that's being provided out in that ecosystem today gives people an opportunity to iterate, fail fast, and you're right that you set some sort of you know, confidence in that for this particular application, we're happy with you know, an 80% confidence coefficient, right? Or, or something a little good higher, enough. but it's good enough. So having said that, now what can we learn from the traditional data quality, you know, chief data officer practitioners, those who have been very dogmatic, particularly yeah. in certain industries, what can we learn from them and take I into this new world? I, I think from my point of view and what my experience has always been is that those individuals have an unparalleled command of the business and have an appreciation for the end goal that the business is trying to accomplish. And it's taking that instinct, um, that knowledge, and applying that to the emergence of what's happening in the technology world and, and bringing those two things together, right? I, I think it's, it's not so much as, you know, there's a practical application in that sense of, okay, here's the technology options that we have to do these, you know, these desired, you know, engagements, whether again, it's the, the pricing engagement, the cybersecurity or whatever, it's more, how can we accelerate what the business is trying to accomplish and uh, applying this, you know, this technology that's out there to the business problem? I think in a lot of ways, you know, in the past, it's always been, hey, I've got this really neat technology, how can I make it fit somewhere? And, and now, I think those folks bring a lot of relevance to the technology to say, hey, here's a problem we're trying to solve. Legacy methodologies haven't been effective, haven't been timely, haven't been uh, scalable or whatever. How can we apply what's happening in the market today to these problems? Hmm. Um, you guys adapt in particular, uh, to me anyway, a, a good signal of the maturity model, and the, the maturity of, of Hadoop. It's, it's starting to grow up um, pretty rapidly. Uh, you know, see Hadoop 2.0, and so where are we at? What do you see as the progression? Um, and where are we going? So, you know, I mentioned it, it uh, on theCUBE the last time at Summit, and I said I believe that, you know, Hadoop is the operating system of big data. Mm. And I believe that, you know, there's a huge transition taking place. Um, that was, there was some interesting, you know, response to that on, on Twitter and some of the other channels, but um, I, I stand behind that. I think that's really what's happening. I look at, you know, what people are engaging us to do is really start to transition away from the legacy methodologies, and they're looking at these not just lower cost alternatives, but also more flexibility. And we talked about, you know, at Summit, the notion of that revenue curve, right? And cost takeout's great on one side of the coin, right? Or one side of the defense here, but I think equally, or even more importantly, is the, the change in the revenue curve. And the insight that people are finding because of these unique channels or the omni channels you described, and being able to look at all these dimensions of data in one, you know, unified place, is really changing the way that they can go to market, they can engage consumers, um, and that they can provide access to the analysts. Yeah, that's I mean, ultimately that's the most important. We had Stuart uh, Madnick on, who's maybe the guy who's written textbooks on operating systems. You, we, you probably use them. I know I did. But, uh, <laughs> and maybe they were gone by the time you got there. But <laughs> I'm a little younger than I. But the, the point being, you know, Hadoop as an as an operating system, the notion of a platform is really is changing dramatically. So um, I think you're right on on that. Okay, so what's what's next for you guys? Uh, we talked about you know customer traction, yep. proof points. You're working hard on that, I yep. know. Um, you guys got great tech, you know, an amazing team. Um, what's next for you? So I think it's it's continuing to look at the market in um, being flexible with the market around as these use cases develop. So you know, obviously as a startup, we're focused in a couple of key areas where. We see a lot of early adoption and a lot of pain around the problems that we can solve, but I think it's really about continuing to develop those use cases um, and expand into the market to become more of a you know a holistic provider of analytic solutions on top of Hadoop. Mm -hmm. How, how's uh, how's Cambridge working out for you, right? I mean, the company moved up from uh, the, you know, the founders moved up from New Haven. Yep. And, and chose chose the East Coast, chose Cambridge. We were obviously really happy about that as East Coast people. Sure. Um, you don't live there full time, but you might as well. <laughs> um, yep. So how's that working out? You know, talent pool. You know, the the vibrancy of the community, the the you know the, the young people that you're able to tap. Um, sure. How's that all going? So I see there's a bunch of dimensions around that. One, it's hot. Right? <laughs> it's really really hot. <laughs> and um, humid. Yes. <laughs> but um, it's been actually fantastic. And if you look at 
not just the talent inside the team, but I think around the team. So if you look at our board, right, you know, Jit Saxena, Chris Lynch, right, has been very successful in the database community over you know decades of experience. You know, and getting folks like that onto the board, Felda Hardiman has been you know in this space as well for a long time. Having folks like that as you know advisors and providing guidance to the team, absolutely incredible. Hackreduce is a great facility where we do things like hackathons, meetups, get the community together. Um, so I think there's been a lot of positive um, inertia around the company just being here in Cambridge, but you know, from a, a, a development or resource or recruiting point of view, it's also been great because you've got some really exceptional database companies in this area, and you know, history will show you like there's been a lot of success here, not only in incubating technology, but, but building real database companies. And you know we're an, a startup on the block that people are very interested in, and I think we show a lot of you know dynamics that are changing in the market and the way the market's moving. So the ability for us to recruit talent is exceptional, right? We've got a lot of great people to pick from. We've had a lot of people join from you know other previously very successful database companies. The team's growing you know significantly in the engineering space right now. Um, but I, I just you know I can't say enough good things about the community. Hackreduce and all the resources that we get access to because we're here in Cambridge. Because the Hackreduce is cool, so you guys are obviously leveraging that. You do how-tos, yep. bring people into the, so Hackreduce is essentially this, it's not an incubator, it's really more of a, an idea cloud, it's a resource cloud, really. Um, uh, started by Fred Lalonde and Chris Lynch, and, and, and essentially people come in, they sh share ideas. You guys, I know, have hosted a number of, of how-tos, and, yep. and it's basically open. You know, we've done some stuff there. It's, very cool. Yeah, you know, and I think, you know, it's even, for us, it's also a great place to recruit, right? We yeah. meet a lot of talented people there, and, you know, with the university participation as well, we get a lot of mm -hmm. talent coming in and participating in these activities, and we do things that aren't just HADAP related either. I mean, we've had people yeah, in sure. and teach Hadoop sessions and just sort of evangelize what's happening in the ecosystem around us, and like I said, it's just, it's been a great resource pool to engage with, and uh, I think it's been as beneficial to the community as it has been to us. So, very grateful for that. All right, Scott, well, aw as always, awesome seeing you. I knew you were gonna have some good practitioner perspectives on uh, on data quality, so really appreciate you stopping by. My pleasure, thanks All for right, having great me. great to see you again. Take care. All right, keep it right there, everybody. We'll be right back with our next guest. This is Dave Vellante with Jeff Kelly. This is theCUBE. We're live here at the MIT Information Quality Symposium. We'll be right back. <laughs>